lecture this evening will be presented by Professor Michael Cameron of the University of Portland. Professor Cameron earned his doctorate at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. His particular interest has been the use of sacred scripture by St. Augustine. The fruit of this long and extensive research was published by Oxford University Press in 2012 under the title, Christ Meets Me Everywhere, Augustine's Early Figurative Exegesis. His topic this evening is the use of scripture in Augustine's Confessions, that most beautiful of all Christian books. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michael Cameron. Thank you, Doug, I appreciate that very much. And thank you for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate the time to be able to discover together uh, something rich about this wonderful text, um, which is so well known and yet so little known in some ways. And um, I can't think of a better place in the Pacific Northwest to come and do this together. In the middle of one night, about the year 396, Augustine awoke to news he had been dreading for weeks. Friend and monastic brother Posidius gently touched his, soldier, his shoulder. Father Augustine, he said, please come. Bishop Valerius has died. Augustine quickly stirred himself, closed the codex of the Psalms that he'd been reading before retiring a few hours before. A great gathering of the people would happen later that day, as well as a gathering of local clergy. In the small seaside town of Hippo on the Mediterranean coast of Africa, that had been Augustine's home for the last five years. Augustine's mind wandered back to the day of his visit to Hippo when he thought he was safe from being pressed into ministry. Bishop Valerius, told the crowds, look, Father Augustine is here. He's actually a visiting lay teacher and writer, but Valerius thought he would make a fine assistant priest and future bishop. Augustine was cornered and forced with many tears to commit himself to church ministry rather than monastic contemplation as he desired. He remembered back to that day and realized that a new door was opening and a new field was opening before his very eyes that night. And in fact, you know, within a few hours, he would ascend the bishop's chair and become that bishop that he had once dreaded becoming. Now in the mid-390s, a number of factors provoked Augustine as he ascended that bishop's chair. There were ongoing conflicts, first against the combative Manichaeans, whom he knew so well, having been one of them, who kept reminding him and the people of Hippolo, Pippo that he was part of them, and probably secretly still was, and the stubborn Donatists who challenged the validity of his baptism. He was baptized up there in somewhere off in Milan, that place across the sea. Then there were the challenges of being a complex man teaching simple faith to throngs of ordinary people under his charge. He had the nagging, gnawing inner desire to make sense of this long and twisting journey that he'd had from being a Manichaean hearer to now suddenly Catholic bishop. The impact of deeper perspectives on his understanding about Christ and the utter gratuity of God's grace were stirring within his heart. He had taken from Valerius and from authors like Origin of Alexandria or people he heard in Living Voice like the great Ambrose of Milan, a great love for scripture, 
and a desire for its deep spiritual wisdom. That stood alongside the urging of his philosophical mentors who had told him to enter into those innermost places of your being. And all these filtered through Augustine's training in rhetoric, plus his introspective tendency, his daily reading of the Psalms with his monastic brothers, growing esteem for the sacramental power of biblical memory and narrative. Together, they converged to help Augustine produce within the following several years an unprecedented and still startling work of white hot Christian spirituality, the Confessions. This work concentrated Augustine's prodigious analytical powers upon the dynamics of faith and grace within a human person, Augustine himself, to create a grand narrative of desolation and searching and conversion. The Confessions, an utterly unheard of kind of literature at the time, has ever since been imitated but never duplicated. It is ever surprising, sometimes blush-inducing, but its immediacy, however, is deceptive because it's not a mere tell-all. It's rather a carefully constructed narration of personal experience transposed into spiritual theological art. Not an autobiography in any usual sense. It is rather, as Peter Brown, his, the master biographer uh, of Augustine, said, quote, it is quite succinctly the story of Augustine's heart, his feelings, his affectus, end of quote. Why did he write this book? I've got a bunch of texts I've given you, and there's not a lot of white space on here, I realize. But this will be a help for us in trying to work through what is a very dense, multi-layered work. And I'll just be pointing to various texts as we move through. For the moment, I just want to look at the very top one on the heading here, in which he does state for us why he wrote. And it's the best clue, probably, I would say, to the purpose of the work. Okay, at the, at the top, you see, he says, why then am I relating all this at such length? Certainly not in, to infor, in order to inform you, and the you, of course, is God. Part of the unusual format of this work, it's not a narrative in a third person sense, it's in a second person sense. And in a first person sense, he's speaking to God. Not in order to inform you, I do it to arouse my own loving devotion toward you and that of my readers, so that together we may declare, great is the Lord and exceedingly worthy of praise. His strategy was to invite his readers into the text by allowing them to eavesdrop on his conversation with God, in which he assembles a kind of mosaic self-portrait using tiles from scripture, especially the Psalms. Whatever other reasons he had for writing, he was defending himself, he was teaching people, he was speaking of mystical prayer, he also wished to offer himself as a living laboratory of God's grace and wisdom come alive within a living human person. And the stunning result is still a modern must-read, even in secular circles, that remains not only in print, but almost it enjoys almost continual flow of new translations. There's probably five or six available on shelves as we speak. The format in particular is striking. It's not just a discourse or a sermon. The book in its entirety, as I said, is a 
prayer in the presence of God, a discussion between Augustine and God. It's theology in its native habitat of prayer. But there are oddities about this book. It's not true autobiography. It covers one thing in his life for pages and pages and then skips 10 years and goes to something else. It's not autobiography in the classic sense, but rather kind of like how I've lived my life in God's presence and what that means for all the rest of us. Millions and millions of people have read this book. At various points, he looks sidelong at his readers and speaks about them. So he's alone with God, yet in the presence of thousands, if not millions of people. So there is a paradox. He explains himself and his life, and yet clearly you can see he's also teaching, hoping to persuade others, hoping to communicate to them the way he feels about God. There are long passages of philosophical discourse as he thinks about the nature of time or the experience of death. There are long passages of biblical exegesis, Discussions of how to read the Bible, that can become quite theoretical. Some people have said Augustine was shotgunning his life out onto the page and didn't really have a plan. Uh, that the book was, as uh, the great scholar, a French scholar of the mid-20th century, Henri Montbou, said it was, quote-unquote, badly composed. The first nine books of the Confessions deal with the narrative of his life up to the time of the conversion and baptism about age 33. Book 10 is a meditation on his present spiritual state, the current struggles of his life, which still affect him as a bishop. He's very candid about these things. Talks about having sexual dreams, for instance, and people may have asked, do I really want to know this about my bishop? Uh, he struggles with temptations about food and music, and many find these particularly hard. I know I did. But he found these as unwelcome enticements to his sense of pleasure, though he does appreciate the hymns of Ambrose. It comes of absolute candor about himself and about his place before God, which is artfully expressed in the title of the book, which is one of the few books of Augustine's that he himself titled. Many things just take a theme. But confessiones in Latin has a double meaning that he refers to fairly regularly in his sermons. Confessio is the admission and confession, the verbalization of sin and guilt as we think of it, but it is also praise. So it has a double sense to it. And in fact, if anything, the aspect of praise really has uh, the stronger element. One cannot see into the depths of one's weaknesses or inadequacies, Augustine thinks, without grace. And so grace is really the story here, not just sin. Grace intervenes in life and lifts us up to deliver us, to heal us. Only the healed person knows the full depths of how sick he or she was and can speak about it. So Augustine is able to go back and examine his past life as well as his present life in the light of the grace of mercy that he now enjoys. Books 11 to 13 are an examination of God's will and ways from the first chapters of the Bible, three books dealing with essentially just one chapter in Genesis. In fact, book 11 deals with one verse. Why so much for one verse? Well, you've been set up in that one verse for the problem of the relation of the eternal, timeless God to creative temporality of earth. How do those two come together? But that's only the beginning of the issues here. As you begin reading this book, you see and want to ask yourself, what is going on with this book? Why is he telling me all this? What was his purpose? 
The answer is multifaceted, but it eventually it, it finally has a very simple root, as I think I've been suggesting with that top quote. He wants to stir love within himself and within his readers. Now, recent scholarship has gone through a number of phases on confessions, on the meaning of it, on what the strategies of it are. Uh, for a long time, into the mid-20th century, confessions was judged theologically anyway, mostly in terms of its dogmatic statements. Or it can be judged in terms of the philosophy going on, which is, there's plenty of that happening, especially as you get into book seven. And Augustine could be measured against scholastic categories, um, uh, an unhistorical way of, of trying to appreciate this uh, multi-layered work. Ressourcement and the Nouvelle Théologie in the middle of the 20th century helped us begin to see patristic texts more in their native uh, theological and historical habitat. And it led to a renewal of reading Augustine as a spiritual master. Also, Pierre Carcel and others led into a historical reading of Augustine. What was the person who was behind this obviously constructed text? What was really going on with that friend who died in book four? What was going on with those platonic books in book seven? Who gave them? gave him those books. And how about that garden scene in book eight, the Tola Lege everybody knows about? Was that really true? Did that happen? Questions about the reality, the historical truth coming through uh, were uh, very prominent within especially the mid-20th century. Peter Brown's autobiography, uh, or biography rather, came out in 1967 and it was a landmark work. It uh, went beyond dogmatic and philosophical categories into social cultural study. Uh, he too was after the you know, real historical Augustine, if you will, but he wrote with a theological sensitivity, if not expertise, uh, by his own admission, with very uh, strong uh, sensitivity to ancient literary categories and he himself is a master stylist. Uh, if you've not read Peter Brown's biography of Augustine, this is a treat in store for you at some point, and I urge you to get to it. But recent scholarship has been especially representing the literary and rhetorical dimensions of this text and asking what was it that Augustine was trying to do in terms of what's in front of the text? What's he trying to do with his readers? And how is he trying to do it? My very dear friend, Father Tom Martin, uh, OSA, from uh, Villanova University, whose ninth anniversary of his passing was just on Monday, and I miss Tom to this day. Um, he would have just relished this moment being here with all of you. Um, Tom wrote cogently in a seminal essay, one of his best, I think, that drew on the work of the French historian of ancient philosophy, Pierre Adot. The uh, philosophy is a way of life. And Tom spoke of confessions as a work of spiritual exercise, a concept that has some resonance on this campus, I think. <laughs> Confessions, that is, as a product of spiritual exercises and a model of spiritual exercises. He spoke of confessions having a pedagogic function, working with the reader into the spirituality and the, the, the depth of conversion that he himself experienced, you see. In 2004, unaware of Martin, uh, Anne-Marie Cotze wrote of the quote-unquote protreptic function 
of confessions. Now, protreptic was an ancient literary form meant to woo people into a new way of life. Philosophers used it to woo people into the life of philosophy. And in fact, we have an example of this in Confessions itself in book three, when we hear of Augustine reading a book by Cicero as basically a freshman in undergrad in college in Carthage, about 19 years old. He reads the Hortensius of Cicero. Now Cicero was a great orator, a great practitioner of, of rhetorical art, but he wrote this little book to woo people into philosophy, to get them to love it. And it hit Augustine like a ton of bricks. And he prays about it even in confessions. He says, Father, this changed my feelings about you. Fascinating thing to say about a pagan work. But it was a protreptic. It was something to move people into the love of wisdom. <clears throat> Both approaches stress the literary qualities of the text and how they persuade readers to love. That's what he says he's doing. I want to stir love in myself. I want to stir love in my readers. And it suggests the ped pedagogic on the one hand and the uh, protreptic on the other move in the direction that I'm talking about, which is the rhetorical dimensions of the text. In other words, how he woos people by using the rhetorical arts in which he was accomplished. He was a professional, in fact, a teacher. By this, I don't mean how it compares to ancient rhetorical theory, but rather how it works in practice, which Kotze notes may well burst the bounds of ancient theoretical patterns you know, breakdowns of how speeches work, the five parts of rhetoric and so on. And in fact, it almost certainly does, as all creative, you know, truly new and creative works do. The question becomes, how does he do this? What strategies does he use to stir up love in himself and his readers? Just dipping into the confessions, you might think he tries to do this by being intellectually dazzling talking philosophically about the essence of being and the nature of time. And he does get into those things, but in a sense, it's not simpler than that. He stirs up love by telling stories. His story, and actually in uh, essence, the big story of God's salvation in relationship to the world, and the device then by which we are to join with him in his love for God is the narrative of his life. But it's not mere self-revelation. By it, he desires to bring us into his life. We are to identify with him. We are to convert to God with him. Let's talk about rhetoric for just a second. In the ancient world, rhetoric was the ars loquendi. It was the art of speaking, a highly developed art form that sought to paint life and truth with words. When the rhetorician turned bishop Augustine portrayed his quote unquote restless heart in the confessions, he used a palette of cover, colors that came from the Bible especially not as mere background or illustration or kind of independent support for what he was saying. He uses scripture itself to tell his story. So the lecture tonight is exploring those ways that he's joining rhetorical skill to his reading of the Bible to create a spiritual self-portrait that remains one of the great masterpieces of literature and theology. Rhetoric has a bad rap in the modern world. When we use the word rhetoric, it's generally in a negative sense for disparaging somebody or some way they speak. That's mere rhetoric, just being rhetorical. And in a sense, it loses out on the dimensions that the ancients were so well aware of, of the power of rhetoric 
I might even say the necessity of rhetoric in everyday speech and in speech in, in great uh, arenas like politics and law to move people toward truth and toward action. And just because the, there are a lot of bad actors out there doing terrible rhetoric doesn't make rhetoric itself the villain. And linguistically, we, we tend to scapegoat rhetoric. You know, yeah, there are a lot of bad com commercials and used car salesmen and, and uh, windy politicians who use words the way they want. But rhetoric is really mostly about how we put words together in order to convey and convince others about truth. It's about persuasion. Look at the best kind of rhetoric that uplifts and inspires and reminds people of their forgotten past or the norms of justice or the future possibilities in a desolate situation. Think about Lincoln's second inaugural. Think about binding up the nation's wound to do the right as God gives us to see the right. Or FDR, and the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Or JFK, ask not what your country can do for you. MLK, I've got a dream. Obama, not red states and blue states, but United States. They can capture in a thumbnail powerful feelings and visions and move people to good action. The ancients were more aware of that than we are, I'm convinced. We let in the demonic aspect of rhetoric through the back door because we're not aware of it. The ancients understood the possibilities and powers of language. They understood its risks better than we do also for that reason, I think. The ancient Education, admittedly limited to a few people, mostly male, virtually all male, had two phases, grammar and then rhetoric. Grammar taught you how to read a text, how to establish the, the text, the letter of a text. Rhetoric taught you how to persuade. And this was the basis for careers in government, in politics, in law for arguing cases uh, about wills or treaties. And rhetoric was about arranging speech in the most convincing way possible. We have to arrange speech. Might as well learn about how to do it well. Not to beat too much on modern culture, but scientific mentalities have taken over in the last couple centuries to the point where it has dismissed the, the beautiful and indeed the rhetorical. Rhetoric used to be a staple of liberal education. About the mid-19th century, it got sort of you know, shunted off. And now it's about pretty speech and doesn't really have a place in modern uh, liberal arts, unfortunately. But rhetoric is always operating, whether we're paying attention to it or not. The question becomes, if someone is using rhetoric, how, how they do so? And that's one of the questions I'm asking here. Now, to get going on this, let's take a look at the v opening of confessions. Now, this is not on your handout, so let's just take a look at it here. Augustine begins confessions. Of course, beginnings are always important, right? Great are you, O Lord, and exceedingly worthy of praise. Your power is immense, and your wisdom beyond reckoning. So, we humans, a due part of your creation, long to praise you. We who carry our mortality about with us, who carry the evidence of our sin, and with it the proof that you thwart the proud. Yet, these humans, do part of your creation as they are, still do long to praise you. You stir us so that praising you may bring us joy. Because... You have made us and drawn us to yourself. And our heart is restless 
until it rests in you. That last sentence is probably the most famous one that Augustine ever wrote. But it's not just catchy and bumper sticker quotable. It's a brilliant shorthand description, actually, of Augustine's entire spirituality. And he characterizes the exact inner state of his own life, his own soul, and his readers. But notice the, the dynamism and the energy in that sentence. There's movement here. We're coiled energy, wishing to go somewhere else from where we are. Being here, but wanting to be over there. Longing for that state of rest for which now we can only pine. Packed into that one little sentence is a tension between earth and heaven, time and eternity, indeed an entire vision of human history. All the roiling and bubbling and churning we do in nations and in families and in ourselves is all a restlessness for God. His theology is packed into this paragraph as well. We carry our mortality about with us, evidence that God thwarts the proud. A statement about humanity, though we are created by God, we are in a state of disrepair. With death looming over us, no matter what age we are. There's also something else going on. I put into italics, if you can pick it out, parts of the Bible that he has threaded into this paragraph. And it's worth noting. Uh, Great are you, O Lord, exceedingly worthy of praise. Uh, that's a text uh, from Psalm 27. We carry about our mortality. That's 2 Corinthians 4.10. You thwart the proud. That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. So there's a kind of stitching together of quotes of the Bible. He weaves in and out, and he places them just like this into the body of his narrative so that the Bible becomes the voice of his story. It's an artful move. Using words that are familiar to people, that they'll have known and heard in the liturgy. It's a rhetorical act that acts as kind of a hook to draw people into his life and into the uh, substance of the Bible. Better know this. Augustine has designs on you as a reader. He's, he wants to move you. Just beware. Above all, he uses the Psalms. Hundreds and hundreds of little pieces taken from here and there. Uh, excuse me a second. I lost, lost my spot. Here we go. To portray himself in the words of the Psalms and indeed become the very voice of the Psalms. So how does Scripture work rhetorically in confessions? His use of the Bible is very striking. Editions of confessions that italicize scripture quotes like this make first-time readers say, what the heck is going on between Augustine and that book? Sometimes he quotes it directly, other times he alludes to it, sometimes the words appear like his own words. So part of the answer about the persuasion to stirring love in himself and in his readers has to do with the use of the Bible. What I'd like to propose to you is a kind of framework for thinking about this. Scripture as agent, Scripture as persona, and Scripture as self. And that's the breakdown of the text I've got here, and we'll look at these. We won't dwell on hangover, all of them, uh, in the same way, 
but I'd like to suggest to you that's a, one, a, a helpful way of thinking about, at least initially, how the Bible functions rhetorically in the Confessions. Scripture is agent. He chooses to make the Bible at certain points a character in his story. It's a catalyst. It's, it, it moves the, the narrative of the story along. It does things. Uh, one example would be uh, the very first quote you've got uh, there, 1.1. This comes from book three of the Confessions, where he's about 19, has just read Cicero's Hortensius, and he decides, I know what I'll do. I'll go and look at that Bible that my mom and my, all her friends back in Hippo used to tell me was full of wisdom. I didn't believe them now, but now I get wisdom, so I'm going to look at this book. Great. He opens the book, begins reading it, and says, ooh, this isn't very nice. It's not very beautiful. Cicero taught me what beauty and rhetoric is and how it's related to wisdom. This, if that's true, this is not wisdom. He closed the book, didn't look at it again, or at least that version of it, for 10 years. What you get there in this quote is his kind of, you know, bishop's way of critiquing himself back then. I was too big for my own britches. That's in book three. Fast forward to book five, second text. In the narrative, he's now grown up. He is a teacher of rhetoric. In fact, he's been doing this for years, left Carthage and North Africa behind, went into teaching in Rome for a while, and then got drafted into the imperial service. He was the imperial panegyrist, and just arrived in Rome to take up his duties, uh, rather in Milan, I mean, uh, which then was the power center of the Western Empire. And he goes into the cathedral church at Milan to hear the great, elegant, well-spoken Bishop Ambrose. He says, I wasn't listening to what he had to say. I wasn't interested. I wanted to hear how he said it. But then he actually uses a quite Ciceronian principle. Cicero said, you can't really separate language and substance. And Augustine says, after a while, I, I couldn't separate how he said it from what he was saying. And what he was saying began to seep into my heart. And he says, once and again, indeed frequently, I heard some difficult passage in the Old Testament explained figuratively. I delighted to hear Ambrose asserting in his sermons to the people as a principle on which he must insist emphatically, the letter is death-dealing, but the Spirit gives life. He would draw aside the veil of mystery. He got to see the Bible in a different way. So the Bible, again, encounter the Bible moves his story forward. Fast forward again, chapter 7. We haven't gone very far, actually, in two books, two or three books since book 5. We haven't gone very far, temporally speaking. He's still in Milan. He's still discussing philosophy and uh, new viewpoints to people. Uh, and he reads these Platonic books that are stirring in him. But then he decides, oh, I'm going to go back to those texts that Ambrose keeps talking about, particularly he keeps talking about Paul, so therefore, with intense eagerness, this is 1.3, I seized, love that, I seized on the hallowed calligraphy of your spirit. One of uh, Sister Maria Bolding's more elegant uh, translations. The hallowed calligraphy of your, of your spirit, that is the words of the scriptures, most especially the writings of the apostle Paul. In earlier, earlier days, his teaching was self-contradictory, it seemed to me, and in conflict with the witness of the law and prophets. But now, as the problems melted away, your chaste words presented to me a single face. A divine face. 
had a single aspect to it. Two sides of every face, but it had a single aspect now. He saw the Bible as a unified whole. Again, a new encounter that moves the story of his conversion along. Uh, eventually completely converted by book 13, he's exploring the Bible and speaks about it, as you see there in the fourth passage. So that's scripture as uh, agent. Let's move on to scripture as persona. This is a bit different of an approach in which we find Augustine is now inhabiting the words of the Bible in a way that tells his story. If you would look at the texts under number two, There's this text coming from book two, the famous story of the pear tree incident, which even people who don't know Augustine very well may have heard of this, where he talks about being basically a teenage uh, ragamuffin and going out with his friends and they stole a bunch of pears. And he goes on for pages and pages about this little prank and uh, I've heard people say, and I've seen authors say, basically, Augustine, will you please get over this? Forgive yourself and move on. Uh, but in fact, there's a lot more going on here. I mean, let's give Augustine a little slack. He has something that he's pursuing. Close to our vineyard, there was a pear tree laden with fruit. All right, well... There's a reminiscence here of the Garden of Eden in which there were trees full of fruit that were beautiful to the eyes and nourishing to the heart. He goes on down to say, well, you know, we shook them off. We had great quantities, not to, for ourselves, but perhaps to throw to the pigs. Do you see that? Okay, another evocation, a kind of inhabitation of a biblical character, the prodigal son, who goes off, spends the inheritance from his father, his living father, ends up hungry and feeding pigs, and wishes he could eat what the pigs were eating. Okay, I use the word inhabitation. He's taking up the persona of Adam, in the garden. He's taking up the persona of the prodigal son in the biblical parable. In order to tell his story, he becomes these people. Move down to 2.2. This one's a little more uh, uh, indirect. In book seven, when he mounts what essentially becomes a philosophical, platonic ascent to the divine essence. Um, Plotinian, that is to say, inspired by the philosopher Plotinus. Uh, what's not obvious is, is that he is weaving into this reminiscences of the story of Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33, where Moses asks to see God's glory, and God refuses, disallows it, and then passes by as Moses is, uh, is hidden in the cleft of the rock. Look at the sequence here. My mind attained to that which is, great highfalutin philosophical language, in the flash of one tremulous glance. Then indeed I perceived your invisible reality through created things, an evocation of Romans 1.20. But I couldn't sustain it. Accordingly, I looked for a way to gain the strength I needed to enjoy you, but did not find it until I embraced the mediator between God and humankind, the man, Christ Jesus. In Augustine's exposition of Psalm 138, preached many years later, he actually has a long section on that vision of Moses on Mount Sinai. 
in which he talks about Moses wanting to make a kind of ascent to the divine and God turning him away and pointing him to the incarnation. It's a fascinating explanation of the passage, which I think is somewhat buried here, but I think is present in this text where he admits that he did not understand and could not attain or sustain, rather, that vision until he embraced the mediator, Christ Jesus. And then there are famous passages in Book 8, just before the Tololege, the garden conversion scene, when he reads uh, Paul's letter to the Romans and all, all becomes light and sweet, right before that, of course, as you're reading Book 8, you, you can feel the drumbeat of the story moving toward conversion. You know it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And then suddenly he stops, and we get page after page after page of his self-analysis of the human will within himself, two wills divided between different desires. He wants to delight in the law of God, but I'm not able to perform God's law. Well, the texts, as you can see here in that third quote, uh, they all come from Romans 7, which if you know Romans chapter 7 is the discussion of Paul's divided will saying, the very thing I want to do, I cannot do, and the thing I don't want to do, I do. And who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, which in Latin, thanks be, is gratia, which Augustine read as grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes the Apostle Paul. At this time, he thought Paul was speaking in Romans 7 autobiographically. So in a sense, he's becoming Paul. So he's become the prodigal. He's become Adam. He's become Moses. He's become the Apostle Paul. And there are a number of other of these taking up of the persona, the, the person, the, originally a mask uh, that, a cost, that, a, that a, uh, an actor would wear. I think the most potent use, however, of rhetorical use of scripture uh, within the confessions is this third category. It's a little more subtle and indirect, but it's powerfully done and it covers a lot of these other uh, snippets of psalms that he uh, uses throughout. An example would be uh, on your text there. When he speaks about the Psalms in uh, book nine, and he says, how loudly I cried out to you, my God, as I read the Psalms of David, songs full of faith, outbursts of devotion with no room in them for the breath of pride. Uh, dropping down a little, I. I wish the Manichees could be somewhere nearby without my knowing it, gazing upon my face and listening to my voice as I read the fourth psalm. Now, this is in Milan. This is before he's baptized. This is in a retreat setting with his mother and his son and some friends and his brother, and they're going to be baptized, but they're reading the scriptures together. A little different, actually, from the philosophical works he's known for from that period. Uh, actually, he's, telling, he's turning it all to scripture now uh, by the time he writes Confessions. What I want to get to is I want to point to two, uh, several little passages here, which I put the Latin in there uh, just to underline the importance of it. Would that they had heard what these words of the psalm did to me. I want to emphasize that because it, it points to the sacramental power of the scriptural words that he's speaking about here. They have a power to him. They don't just 
express or describe or paint a picture. They do something. So feature it. They did this. As I uttered those words of mine, interspersed with yours, it's a complex idea, but he's talking about words of scripture that he has mixed together with his, with his own words. And they blend and come together as he says, I conversed with myself and addressed myself in your presence out of the most intimate feeling of my soul. De familiare affectu animi mei. Which is to say, his own words and the words of the Bible are interlacing and you know, mutually reinforcing each other. That's what's characteristic of the Confessions. Because when he uses these texts, they become his words, as if he had composed them. That's how they come across. He's not just drawing biblical support for what he's thinking. He's using the texts as his own words. An example of doing that would be the next text out of Confession 7, where he says, I was warned to return into myself, I entered under the guidance of, your, of the innermost places of my being. Now, he's do, it's a philosophical move he's making, and yet he threads it with words from the Psalms. I only did this because you had become my helper, Psalm 29. I entered then the vision of my spirit, such as it was, I saw the unchanging light. O oh, eternal truth, true love, beloved eternity, you are my God, for you I sighed day and night. As I first began to know you, you lifted me up, that while that which I might see exists, indeed I was not yet capable of seeing it, for sin had caused my soul to dwindle away like a spider's web. Okay, he's, he's putting these words together. Now, What's not obvious here is that in the texts and in the, particularly the sermons on the Psalms that he had preached before this. So these are datable to the years just prior to him becoming bishop. We can see him develop a theology of scripture in which the voice of the Bible is seen as the voice of Christ, such as we heard last night. Uh, Father, it was so rich. Augustine is fully aligned with Christ in the Psalms, speaking the words from his own subjectivity, as you said. But he has developed also in this theology that other part of it that you're mentioning, that we share that subjectivity of Christ in the Psalms, the one who speaks the Psalms is Christ. He knows this actually from the Gospels, the passion, that the height of the passion. Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Augustine says, hmm, that comes from the 21st Psalm, 22nd in our Hebrew-based Hebrew uh, Bibles. Let's read the rest of that. I cry out and you don't answer. My sins are blocking me from you. Augustine says, wait, sins? Christ has sins? How can Christ speak of sins? I know why Christ speaks of sins. Paul tells me in Romans 6 that we know that we were crucified with Christ. So in a sense, he kind of triangulates the psalm text with the gospel text of the passion with the Apostle Paul, three-way reading, and says, I know this means Jesus spoke not for himself. Jesus spoke for us. In fact, this is the act of redemption itself. He is taking the voice of Adam and speaking out of the mortal desperation of the great original sinner. 
And therefore, he also speaks because we are all in Adam. He's speaking for all of us. This is his voice, but it is our voice too. He'll go on to talk in other expositions of the Psalms in very like terms, very explicit, telling his congregation, do you hear this text? Do you hear this voice? Whose voice is this? It's the voice of Christ. But it is also your voice. Do you hear your voice? It is your voice. If you want it, if you will it, it is yours. The Psalms are our mirror, he says. When the Psalm prays, you pray. When the Psalm fears, you fear. When the Psalm rejoices, you rejoice. Everything here is our mirror. So there's a conjunction of voice with Christ our Lord in the reading of the Psalms. This creates the basis for our reading of the Psalms as our own prayer. He doesn't just read it and think, it's pretty, it's powerful, I'm going to pray this because it does something for me. No. Deeper than that, there's a kind of identification, a kind of reciprocal act with the text in which we are not only allowed, but we're encouraged to call that text my prayer, your words, my words. Okay, so there's an elaborate foundation laid for this sense of scripture as self, for him to be able to speak these words as his own words. You follow me? Augustine often announced to his dumbstruck hearers in his congregation, we rejoice and give thanks that we have been made not only Christians, but we have been made Christ. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, he says? The grace of God flowing from the head above us If he is the head, we are the members. He and we, one person. The divine teacher conjoins his learners as a single person, he calls it. And Augustine loves to ring the changes on this, even to the point of contorting grammar. Quote, because in me they are I. Because even we are he. Or, quote, and because even he is we. These are especially in the tractates on John's Gospel. As a result, Augustine's purpose in preaching and teaching is not merely to hear Scripture speak of Christ, much, merely, much less merely to speak correct dogma. He rather seeks to stir spiritual love in the body of Christ within the members so that they might read the law or the Psalms as Christ reads them. So, in short, Augustine's sermons are often spiritual exercises like the confessions that train Christians to read the scriptures as Christ reads the scripture. But it's especially apparent in the expositions of the Psalms where he speaks of the concept, a profound, powerful concept of the totus Christus, He never mentions it in Confessions, although it's the kind of ambiance and it's the basis for everything he's doing with Scripture. The totus Christus is the whole Christ of the head and the members. And we exchange voices together as members of that body. So we've looked at these three different phases. I would like to point uh, to this last text as particularly powerful and for you to look at uh, at your leisure. It's quite lengthy. I won't read the whole thing. 
However, it, it shows up again at a very poignant spot in the Confessions at the beginning of Book 11. It's where he's turning to the Bible as the uh, focus for the next three books, 11, 12, 13. And it's a prayer that he prays, not just in the normal form of prayer and confessions, but particularly about the scriptures. Book four of uh, On Christian Teaching, which is about the Bible, first three books. The fourth book is about preaching. And he actually talks there in book four about the preacher praying before preaching. I have an intuition that I'm personally convinced of that what we have here is some of the substance of the prayer that Augustine himself prayed before he preached. Oh Lord my God, hear my prayer. This is 3.3. May your mercy hearken to my longing, a longing on fire, not for myself alone, but to serve the brethren I dearly love. You see my heart and know this is true. Let me offer to you the, sac the service of my heart and tongue, but grant me first what I may offer you, for I am poor, needy and poor, but you are rich to all who call upon you, and you care for us, though no care troubles you. And you, you can see in the scripture column there on the right how, how rich the texture of scripture is here, where he has done exactly this, taken those words of the Psalms as his own and spoken them uh, out of the depth of his own being, the most intimate feeling of my soul, as he says in that, the bottom of that top quote, 3.1. A powerful move that he makes. Peter Brown, in his biography toward the end, he calls the confessions, uh, he calls Augustine in the confessions, quote unquote, gloriously egocentric. I get that. If you only read Confessions, you would think this guy never stops talking about himself, <laughs> right? In fact, if you read other things of his, he almost never does. It's very rare. His sermons, we have more than 800 of them. Taken down by secretaries sitting in front of him just as close as you are to me, we have the actual words. Scholars think there's no reason to think they aren't the actual things he said. There are little sides like, oh, who just came in, you know, or how hot it is, and it stinks in here because it's hot, you know. His book on the Trinity, his letters, hundreds and hundreds of his letters, uh, commentary on Genesis, literal sense, uh, city of God. He doesn't talk about himself. Here he does, gloriously egocentric. What I'd like to agree with about Brown, I'd also like to tweak just a little bit and say the ego involved here includes his readers. It's a single ego, if you will, if you use the Latin. He's trying to bring people into his journey and into his sense of God's grace, to experience the grace of God in their lives as he has experienced it in his. I think there's some powerful lessons to take away from this on several levels. On the scholarly level, I think to, to pursue this dimension uh, would open up brand new vistas for looking at confessions. Uh, not merely as dogma or as history or just looking at the historical Augustine, but to see uh, these devices uh, that make this text what it is and so unique. Uh, but I think also on the individual level, on the personal and let's say pastoral level, to see Augustine preaching these words as if they were for all of us together. As he says uh, at the beginning, at the very first text, at the very top, why then am I relating all this to you? 
to stir loving devotion toward you and that of my reverence, so that together we may declare, great is the Lord. And in fact, that text comes from the beginning of book 11. But do you remember that was the first line of the confessions? So what's he saying? He's taking us in an arc to go back to our own confessions so that we may say this and everyone else will have their own story of confessions, you see. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a salvation project going on, let's say. Uh, one of my friend Tom Martin's uh, favorite text was a sermon of Augustine's, I think it was Sermon, sermon 17, where he says, why am I doing this, meaning preaching? He says, I do this because we're in this together. I don't want to be saved without you. That's his line. Gorgeous. So the pastoral dimension of Augustine's life, his thought, his thinking, are deeply buried in confessions. And it's not just a you know, kind of solo performance. It's a very communal event. I found this image, I was really struck by the beauty of it, the power of it, the colors of it, and then looked and found that it was done by a young guy age 19 from Alaska, apparently in the year 2011. And I give him thanks for this, I tried to give him credit, Kyle Kepler. Uh, is his name, but uh, the image is so striking and riveting, it sort of somehow visually captures a lot of what I'm talking about. Notice the, uh, the image of the church in his hands. And let me conclude by giving you a text from a letter of Augustine's that he was writing to an outsider who had really criticized Christianity, um, thought it had something to do with the fall of Rome. Remember we were talking about this yesterday with your students, uh, Doug. This is to Volusianus in which he tells Volusianus, who's this kind of upstart young pagan who's sort of dialoguing with Augustine about Christianity, and Augustine doesn't answer his questions directly, at least not right away. He seems to say to Volusianus, okay, if you want to get the Christian answer about this, you need to understand the way Christians think. Because we don't think the way you do. In order to do that, you need to read this text that Christians read. That'll teach you how Christians think. And here's the quote, about 20 lines. The Christian writings are so astonishingly profound that even if I had more free time, more intense desire, and more talent to master them alone from the beginning of my boyhood up to my decrepit old age, I would still find myself making progress in them on a daily basis. I don't mean to say that readers come to those matters necessary for salvation with such great difficulty, but even though each person grasps them through the faith without which no one lives a pious and upright life, many, many things remain to be understood by those making progress. These matters in scripture are cloaked in such shadows of mysteries and such fathomless wisdom that lies hidden behind them, not only in the words they used to say what they say, but also in the realities that give themselves to be understood in them. So much so that those with the most years of experience, with the most intelligence, 
and with the most intense desire to learn are the very ones who experience what those same scriptures say elsewhere, quote, when people come to the end, then they're at the beginning. Thank you for letting me share this time with you. And I look forward to a discussion. Please. Did he have a, 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 say again, as a model? Does he see himself throughout the confession as the prodigal son? And is that part of his? Ah. I think it's a story of intense transition and conversion. I think it sets up his basic identity as a sinner, but then the transformation is really the heart of the story, which as it is indeed for the prodigal himself. So it does suggest the return. It's not simply you know, about the sin, as I was saying before. It's about the grace. So uh, it's a useful model. It return I, I gave you that one text out of the pear tree story, but he comes back to it fairly routinely throughout confessions. I mean, but obliquely, indirectly, but clearly. Yeah. So it's, it's powerful for him. Yes? You've uh, talked about the uh, rhetorical function of the scripture and the, in reference to Jesus doing the same thing as someone that mm -hmm. Augustine did. Um, have you, and I, I can just think even Paul Well, it's especially apparent in Paul, as you mentioned, which, where we're on pretty firm ground with his Greco-Roman training, we can see this at work. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, for instance, he, he speaks about, well, he uses certain images in chapter 3, but then he says, well, I've used Apollos and myself as a kind of projection of the image for your sake. Okay, and the word he uses in, in Latin is transfigurare. Now, that's a rhetorical word, which is to say, I use myself as an example for you. Um, there are certain junctures in the scriptures of Paul's letters where it's more obvious than others. The letter of the Galatians is full of intense argumentation in which he uses different rhetorical devices to sort of shame the people at one point and then sort of coddle them at another. I'm going to defer to Father Hardin on the, on the technic, technical parts of this, but I, I think that's going on there. Clearly, if you look at 2 Corinthians 11, where he's had this difficult relationship with the Corinthians, and he basically calls himself a fool. All right, I'm a fool. I'm going to be a fool. I'm going to act the fool. All right, well, this is a rhetorical device in which he's going to put them sort of on the defensive, and then he's going to come in, lower the boom later in the next chapter about his visions and the other, his spiritual authority. All right, so there are things going on there that he's doing to try and persuade people. And that's pretty powerful. Now Jesus, we don't know about Greco-Roman rhetoric exactly, but 
Any teacher can see the mastery of his work with people. He will not give you the truth on a platter. Okay, what does it say? What does the text say? Or have you never read? He tells the parables. I mean, the way Mark tells it is, okay, Jesus says, all right, there was a sower who went out to sow, and it sell, some fell out here, some over there. There was, you know, no fruit. And then finally there was some that grew up 30, 60, 100-fold. Good night. Drive safely. Wait, what, what does that mean? He's, he leaves them kind of out in the, hanging in the wind. Mark says... He tells these parables precisely in order that they may not understand. What is that about? Even Matthew got a little, Matthew kind of tweaks Mark a little bit so that he'll say, well, he taught this so that that they would understand. He sort of really changes the dynamic there a little bit. It's a little tough. But Jesus did seem to have a kind of, you know, reverse psychology going on, at least, which is a kind of rhetorical move. Anyway. Father Harden, I'll give you the privilege. Now, uh, taking up what you, I really appreciated your, 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 your talk. Most of the time just flew by. It really was fantastic. Um, but we, your, the use of scripture as persona that you, you speak so, that, so well about, it, I, it, it doesn't Augustine also do the same thing with the Indian? I was thinking yes. there are two examples with regard to as a kid when he's uh, been educated in the art of rhetoric in school, where he talks about himself having to perform as a word, you know, speak, in, a, in, other, in other words, as a word, say, it takes on the character of Juno. And in the same thing with uh, years when he leaves Dido behind on the on, on, uh, right. cottage, and he, Augustine leaves his mother behind on a cottage, and he's, he's taking on the character of Aeneas, in a sense. There is an ancient device called and it's a mouthful, prosopo poiea. Quintilian, the rhetorician, wrote his handbook in about the first century, uh, which is still an interesting reading. Um, Quintilian writes about it. He says, this is a powerful device. You better watch how you use it. The word, what it means is, literally, prosopo poiea means face-making. And it's I mean, a one a legitimate way to translate it would be impersonation. In a sense, that's, what's, that's the same thing going on here. Quintilian says, watch how you use it because it's very powerful. You can raise the dead with it. What he meant by that, not the Christian sense, what he meant was, if you're discussing a document like a will in a court and there's an unclear passage, if you want to argue for a perspective on that document, you can imitate the voice of the one who created the document who's no longer alive. And that's a way, it's a powerful way to sort of make the dead present in the argumentation. And that's why it was such a, a staple uh, feature of rhetorical education. That, they not only did, they not only imitated characters from the poetry, and the, and the young boys would do the, the, the poetic literary sorts of things, but then in the, in the uh, phase of rhetoric, they would do, as you well know, I'm sure, the thing called declamations, in which they would take a speech of Cicero and just be Cicero. And it would be practice in, you know, becoming what you want to be by kind of being that. So I'm fascinated with that dimension of things and uh, how, particularly how Augustine sees Jesus on the cross doing a kind of prosopopoeia, imitating the voice of Adam, but doing it in such a way that he's really changing Adam. He's not, he's, he's really putting on Adam. It's not phony. It's not just a play or a role play. Jesus really takes on humanity at its worst. So it's a powerful dimension of things, and I'm sure you're right that that's something that Augustine 
worked on, and that's another dimension of it, the, the Dido scenes, and yeah, for sure. Let's do one, two. How's that? Uh, what was the last part? Humility. As sort of a central theme of Augustine's conversion. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Life. For Augustine, above all, it is the humility of Jesus that brings about redemption. Uh, it's not just that there's buckets of blood on the cross, you know, all due respect to Mel Gibson, you know. Seriously. It's Jesus' self-giving. It's an inner spiritual giving, which we're talking about the descent from the very highest pinnacle of creation that we can imagine down to us. And he talks continually about it. Those passages in Book 7 that I was alluding to where he seizes the Apostle Paul, he goes on to talk about well, okay, I read Paul, but I really wasn't getting this because uh, I, I talked like I knew things. But he'll say, where was the humility that brought Christ Jesus down to us? I, you know, I hadn't gotten there yet. And so th this is absolutely essential. Um, it, it's one way in which I think Augustine made an advance over some other early Christian writers. Uh, Origen, in particular, who, who thought of the spiritual knowledge, the attainment of spiritual knowledge as uh, the highest achievement, fully affirming our humanity. He was not a Gnostic. He was not a separatist. I mean, he was not a dualist. But he kind of paid short shrift to the crucifixion. You know, he, he talked about it, but it was more like, okay, that's the starting block. You want to get off? the starting block as fast as possible and get into the spirit. You know, Augustine said, Augustine learned a lot from Origen, I'm convinced, even though he had a funny relationship with him toward the end of his life. But he said, I, I agree with Origen, but let's hold on, hold the phone here a little bit. Let's dig down into the humanity, just what this means, that the Son of God came from the highest heavens down to our life. It's about the humility, which I think he would think of it, to use an analogy, he thinks of it as the, the kind of arrowhead piercing aspect of love. It's the love of God, which encounters us first. It dismays us first by its humility. One of my favorite passages in all of all of Augustine is in Confessions. It's uh, Book 7, uh, Section 18, uh, Part 18, 24. 7.18.24. Where? It's actually partly in one of those texts in there where he talks about embracing the mediator. If you keep reading that section, he says, the Son of God, wisdom of God came down and made the wisdom that we could not take into food that we could take. He was fascinated with nursing mothers. He loved the vision, the idea that a woman would take food that a baby cannot eat and transform it and then give it to her child. To him, that was a supreme image of the Incarnation. He, Jesus transformed the wisdom of heaven that we couldn't take and gave it to us in the form of the milk of wisdom that could be taken. And he goes on to say, the, in that same passage, uh, he says, he, he built a humble cottage of our clay, a clay, as one translation put it, kind of charming. In order that, and he carried us over to himself, in order that when we saw divinity at our feet. We would fall down with amazement at that humility. And then as he rose up, 
he would carry us with him. It's a magnificent uh, image. There's a lot of high, low image going on, you know, up and down sorts of things. And the down part of it is absolutely crucial. It's the humility. Yeah. There's a lot there. Although I was kind of dismayed that my friend Alan Fitzgerald, who, who is the editor of Augustine Through the Ages, the great one-volume encyclopedia on the thought of Augustine, which I commend to you all, uh, somehow he forgot to put a humility article in there. And uh, my other friend, John Cavadini, wrote the article on pride. And so Alan stuck in there at the bottom of the pride article. Uh, uh, well, no, rather, if you go to humility, it says, see pride. <laughs> you know, it's like Alan. <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, anyway, there, there needs to be an article in there about, it, about humility. Anyway, sorry. I, I like the way you finished your presentation about the concept that it can be learning. Yeah, we are in our late we're just starting. And, just in, I, and it took me 45, 50 years to deal with him because yeah. he left the, the woman and the child and all that. And right. I had a, because my father left my mother and me, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Right. And in between, so You're not alone. So I'm somewhere between the grammar and the argumentative stage. Right? So anyway, when I was 50 years ago, senior high school, going home with my friend, because we could leave and go home for lunch in high school when we were seniors. And his family owned a, a large house, kind of like we would have down in the South Hill area. And retarded children were housed there. And I remember we're booking by the room where they're dining and a dozen of them, and we're praying table grace. And when the pastor spoke last night about the illiterate, who wouldn't even know the rhetoric that he knew. Mm -hmm. I knew and I contrasted that with the brilliance mm -hmm. of Augustine or Pascal or whoever, mm -hmm. that I was reading voraciously then. And then I said, that's why this lives, is because woven in there, they could, they could see the sophist words and laugh and say, this isn't real, but they could see the truth, mm -hmm. which is real. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about mm -hmm. it. So, I, so the first I thought, well, I'm a sinner. Ah, oh, he's a sinner. Ah, oh, we're all sinners. Oh, we're all forgiven. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. OK, well, uh, Professor Cameron has a very early plane to catch in the morning. So early, in fact, that he intends to make that flight, land in Portland, and be over to campus to meet his uh, first class <laughs> tomorrow morning, which begins promptly at 8 a.m. Wow. So I think we should uh, bring this to a conclusion. Thank you all for being here.